Hey everybody, this is going to be the EMR class, Emergency Medical Responder here at Gordon Cooper Technology Center. My name is Curtis Rhodes. I'm a paramedic instructor here. I'm going to be your lead instructor for the EMR class, at least for your le the lecture portion of it. Obviously, you see the textbook that is um, on your screen. That's what we'll be using. So let's go ahead and get started. First thing I want to talk about is what an EMR is and what an EMR does. So you see right here, EMR uh, typically going to be the, the first medically trained person to arrive on the scene of an emergency. That's not always the case. Maybe in, in some um, s cities or, or towns or whatever, they have a paramedic. You know, they're all paramedic, all ALS. But uh, traditionally, when you start, especially when you're talking about volunteer fire services or maybe even you know, in, in the oil field or something like that, you might have someone that has an EMR certification. They're going to be the first one to arrive on the scene of an emergency. So you can see that the initial care given, you see it talked about the initial care given. Now, as an EMR, that initial care given is going to be essential because it's provided before more advanced emergency medical care. So, you know, typically the EMR gets there and then maybe an EMT or a paramedic arrives. So it's going to be really important that the EMR is able to do what they're trained to do and follow the correct algorithm, of whatever it is that they've learned. Because by doing that or not doing that, that can mean the difference between life and death. Not managing an airway versus managing an airway certainly can mean the difference between life and death. So you see a, a kind of a little ladder here of care providers, EMTs, AEMTs, that's an advanced, advanced EMT, paramedics, nurses, then physicians, and other allied health professionals. You might think of like respiratory or those type of, you know, just some other type of department that you might find in the hospital. Now within this EMS system, all agencies and personnel, they we, we should all share a mutual understanding of our roles. We all play our own role. Um, you know, some might say one is more important than the other, and there might be, but they're all going to be very important. Without one, it's hard to get to the to the next one. So if you just think about it, you just take you take dispatch out of there. Well, now we don't have anyone giving us the information to go on, on to scene. You take first response out of there, so EMRs, and now whenever the ambulance gets on scene, they've the patient's not been taken care of for the last 10, 12, 15 minutes, or however long it's been. So each and every one of these are going to be very important when we look at, at all of them. So, you know, close cooperation, planning, continual effort, all of those things are gonna be needed when we, when we do this, when we work together as a team. So to best understand the EMS system, you need to follow the sequence of events as an injured or ill patient moves through the system, kind of what we've been talking about. So reporting, report of an incident activates the EMS system. So when someone calls and says, you know, their, their MEMA fell down and, and their knees messed up. So what happens? Emergency Response Communication Center or Public Safety Answering Point receives the call uh, reporting an incident. So sometimes you might have an enhanced 911 center. Those uses computers and determine the location of the landline telephones and they have some, some different systems. But all in all, we're going to have somebody still doing the reporting and, and that's going to have that information is going to have to go somewhere. So within dispatch, hopefully they have appropriate equipment and personnel are going to be dispatched to the scene. Dispatch may occur by landline telephone. Uh, it could be cell phone, pagers, public safety, radio system, computers, all kinds of things. There's lots of things that's paging people out that dispatchers are using and and the way that EMS is receiving the first responders for that matter. So agencies, personnel, equipment that are involved in the first response, they vary by community. So depending, it really varies by uh, budgets, to be honest with you. If you're in a, in a city that or a town that has a pretty good substantial 911 budget, you may have some nice toys and you may have some fancier ways to get dispatched. Uh, if you're in a city or a town that's struggling, you may or may not have those, those nice toys. Then it moves down to the first response. So firefighters, law enforcement personnel, those guys are, are likely to be first on scene. Most communities, they have many EMRs. So, you know, think about the fire department. A lot of times police officers are, have gone through EMR. Sometimes 
um, communities will actually just have citizens that have gone through as well that are, are you know, kind of willing to go out and, and help when they can as well. But they have few EMTs and even fewer paramedics. So that's why it's going to be important that EMRs are, are squared away and able to do the things that they need to do. The EMR, it's a key element. When we talk about things, uh, what the EMR can do, it's a key element in providing emergency care. So I've, I kind of teach my paramedic students that really no amount of good ALS can make up for bad BLS. ALS, advanced life support, BLS, basic life support. So all of your fancy tricks and techniques and toys and everything as a paramedic can't make up for someone neglecting the airway for 10 minutes straight. It's, it's, this is a team effort. So the EMR has to be able to manage the airway properly so the paramedic can then just take it over not initiate, but literally take over the airway and then move on to the next, uh, the next best thing that's for the patient. So EMS response, ambulance staffed by EMTs or maybe eight EMTs, paramedics, that's gonna be the patient's second contact with the EMS system that we've been talking about. So a properly equipped vehicle and the EMS staff make up a basic uh, life support unit or a BLS unit, EMTs, what EMTs do, stabilize the patient, prepare the patient for transport. So in addition to BLS services, patients may receive ALS services from paramedics, so advanced life support. So what we're talking about, the difference is, is BLS are going to help splint things, going to help stabilize, going to help do CPR, uh, going to help load patients, those type of things. ALS is going to do the advanced maneuvers, so the airway maneuvers, all the medications, um, all of the electricity stuff when we start talking about um, shocking patients and using a cardiac monitor. That's kind of the different stuff that we're talking about with BLS and ALS. So ALS personnel can administer IV fluids, certain meds, monitor, treat heart conditions, defibrillation, all of those kinds of things that I was just talking about. When we use that word defibrillation, and you're going to learn this when you go through your BLS um, portion of this class, but it's the administration of an electrical shock to the heart of a patient who is experiencing a highly irregular heartbeat. So um, typically you might see something like ventricular fibrillation that someone gets that in. But it, there's a very specific times that someone gets electricity. So it's going to be important that, the, that you know, the right patient gets the right, the right treatment. Defibrillation may also be done by specially trained EMTs and EMRs. Now, paramedics are also trained to place special airway tubes. We kind of mentioned all of that stuff. All skill levels are based on what is learned in the EMR course. Airway maintenance, bleeding con um, control, prevention, recognition, and treatment of shock. A another way you could look at that as the recognition and treatment of shock is you could look at that as circulatory system. If you'll look at that, if you'll notice, you should kind of see a pattern, A, B, C. Circulation, because a, sh a shock can be a problem within the circulatory system because either the pump is not working right or there's not enough fluid, the pump meaning the heart, not enough fluid within the system, meaning blood, maybe the pipes are messed up, meaning the vessels, but you can, you can start to build little systems and you see airway uh, bleeding and then circulation, or as you see here, treatment of shock. And we're gonna talk about all of that. So EMS system, it also involves law enforcement, fire protection, specialized rescues, patient extrication, lots and lots of other pieces to this EMS system. And then, of course, what are we going to do with these patients? They, the last thing they need is just a paramedic. They don't need a paramedic. What they need is a paramedic to recognize that they're sick, and they need a paramedic to take them to the right place. That's ultimately what these patients need. They don't need the EMR, EMT, AEMT, paramedic, critical care paramedic, don't need any of that stuff on scene when, they're, when they have a, a, a belly bleed or when they have a head bleed, when they are broken. They don't need all of that stuff. What they need is us to recognize that they're sick and broken and for us to take them to the right place. So what we're talking about is hospital care. Hospital emergency department going to be the third contact within the um, EMS system. So it could be necessary for the patient to be transported to the closest appropriate medical facility first for stabilization. Maybe you're unable, maybe someone's unable to get an airway or they need to do an advanced technique that they're not trained on or licensed to. And they go to a, a, the closest place and then they move on for a specialized um, 
treatment center. So you see you have trauma and spinal cord, you have all of these different things that are these specialized centers. So they may go to a local place and get things kind of stabilized and get things kind of um, shaped up and then they're able to get moved on to the next place. So what you might be thinking is they go to one of your local facilities and then they go downtown, right? They go down to the city or go to Tulsa, depending on where you're at here in Oklahoma. Now, public health and EMS. It's important for EMRs to understand the basic function of public health agencies because EMS personnel need to interact with public health practitioners. So we got, there's lots of responsibilities here that we're talking about. Uh, responsibilities of public health departments include monitoring restaurant cleanliness, conducting immunizations, determining incidents of contagious diseases, which ought to mean something to you now, considering where we just came from for last year or two, preventing incident or progression of diseases, lots of things within the public health department. You see all these other things, car seats, seatbelt use, alcohol awareness programs, lots and lots of stuff within public health. Now, let's talk about the history of EMS. Let's get into some EMS stuff. So, History of EMS, EMR should have some understanding of the history of EMS. You guys should know where we come from, who we are, and you know, kind of where we were, we were brought from. So many advances in the civil, civilian EMS have followed progress made in the military medical system. If you've been around this stuff for very long, you recognize that it, it, there's a lot of bad things that go on in war. One of the good things, though, or combat, one of the good things is things come back to the street, though, that get proven overseas. So there's lots and lots of things. Tourniquets were out for quite some time and then they came back because they realized they had made a mistake by taking those out of EMS. We're seeing some issues with blood that are gonna be able to be used soon. We're seeing a lot, obviously lots and lots of trauma changes because of uh, the military medical system. So in the 50s and 60s in the United States, funeral homes, hospitals, volunteer rescue squads, most of those guys, those guys actually provided most of the ambulance service. So the only training available for ambulance attendants was just some basic first aid and that was it. Uh, now, some ph physicians, they recognized that civilian pre-hospital medical care lagged behind military emergency care. And they urged the, urged the National Academy of Sciences to investigate and look into this and see what we can do about it. So as you see listed, 1966, the accidental death and disability, the neglected disease of modern society was published. So that paper described the deficiencies in emergency medical care. What it did is it recommended the development of a national course of instruction. So that's where we start to see some organization behind what we do and how our training goes because they recommended some instruction for pre-hospital emergency care personnel, and that's you and I. So in the early 70s, you had the DOT, or the Department of Transportation, they developed a national standard curriculum for training EMS providers. That seems kind of, hopefully that seems kind of weird to you guys, because it does to me. It seems like somebody in health should probably have the national standard curriculum, but the Department of Transportation does. Uh, I assume it's because we work on roadways and all of that, but nobody has taken it over or, or fixed it. But it does seem odd that the Department of Transportation is kind of, I don't know if the right words are governing body, but it's a, a, we are a piece of that. So now during the 80s, the use of ALS, we mentioned what that was, advanced life support within EMS became common. So, you know, we, we see this progression to where 50s and 60s, when all of this stuff was just start, first starting, we saw people were literally walking, working with, um, you know, kind of just some Band-Aids. They were working with some basic first aid type skills. And as we've seen, it starts progressing. Well, now we're talking about the 80s and ALS, or you might think about paramedics, are um, now becoming a little more common and becoming kind of getting within the EMS system. So now today, we were just went from, jump from the 80s to today, we see that EMS providers are trained through standardized courses conducted at accredited training centers. And what that word, when you see that word accredited means, is that as a governing body essentially that wants to make sure that you guys, the students, are not getting ripped off. So they want to look at curriculum, they want to look at instructors' um, uh, history, and you know, are they uh, are they are they able to to teach this information and look at the way we're doing things and and all of that. So that accreditation is a, is a big deal on our side of the world. So in January of nineteen, the NHTSA. Uh, 
release the report titled the EMS Agenda 2050, a people-centered vision for the future of EMS. And we've seen a couple of these. This would be the second, I believe. And what it does is just kind of talks about the future of EMS and what, what they see to be happening, what they see should, in their opinion, should happen. So you see that we have 10 standard components of an EMS system. We're just going to blaze right through these. So it is listed in your book as well. So 10 criteria, regulation and policy, resource management, human resources and training, transportation equipment, medical support facilities, communication system, public information, medical direction, trauma system development, evaluation. Public information, education. Oh, I hit that one already. Sorry. Here we go. Now, transport. So a word about transportation. With transport, EMRs assist more highly trained EMS personnel in treating and preparing the patient for transportation. So helping everybody, helping the team get the patient ready to get them to where they need to go. So three terms are used to describe proper patient transportation to an appropriate medical facility. So transport, a patient condition requires care by medical professionals but speed in getting the patient to a medical facility is not the most important factor. Typically, when we're thinking critical or stable, or I like to use just kind of sick or not sick, this is more of the not sick patient. Yeah, they're hurt. Yeah, they're sick, but they're not going to die on us right away. That's what I mean by sick or not sick. So sick or, or not sick does not mean they're not sick, and it does not mean they don't need to go to the hospital. What, I'm, what we're saying is, are they going to die in the back of our ambulance, or are they going to be able to make it to the hospital and they just kind of need some antibiotics or you know maybe need their arm fixed or whatever. Then prompt transport. So a patient's condition is serious enough that the patient needs to be taken to an appropriate medical facility in a fairly short period of time. Sounds like we're kind of getting sicker. Rapid transport. This phrase is used for few cases when EMS personnel are unable to give the patient adequate life-saving care in the field. So that's someone, now we're talking about some sick people. These are people that they need to get to the hospital and they need to get to that next level of care fast. So an appropriate medical facility, it could be a hospital, it could be a trauma center, a medical clinic, your book talks about maybe even being a medical clinic. Some things have changed within Medicare guidelines that um, some, some services are actually even transporting to little kind of little dock in a box. So the little medical clinics if that's what's best for the patient. In the past, we have not done that. So the pro, uh, EMS personnel must work closely with their medical director to establish transportation protocols that ensure patients are transported to the closest medical facility capable of providing adequate care. And what we're saying is the medical director and the ambulance crews are all working together as a team and determining this patient is sick and when they are this sick, this is where they should go. Now, Sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. Many times these are all kind of guidelines, just kind of guidance for the EMT or the paramedic. And there is some medic discretion in there as well. But for the most part, everyone's gonna work closely together to get, to get these transportation protocols and, um, and we're gonna follow them. It's very rarely that we do not follow those. So EMR training. EMR course will teach you how to examine patients. That's going to be one of the big things. One of the big things we're going to talk to you guys about doing is examining patients, doing patient assessment, and looking to or determining whether they are sick or not sick. So we're going to use some basic emergency medical skills and help determine it and by being part of this system that we're talking about and help determine whether they're sick or not sick and then having the ability to relay that on to the oncoming crew so they know you know, they need to be thinking about where they're going and what they're doing with that patient. So skills and knowledge learned in this course provide the foundation for the entire EMS system. Everything starts from here. So two main groups you see listed. Skills divided into two main groups. Skills need to treat injury trauma patients, so controlling airway, breathing, circulation, controlling um, external bleeding or hemorrhage, treating shock, treating wounds, splinting injuries, those are all things that we're going to be doing. And then skills needed to care for patients experiencing illness. So we talked about trauma first, now we're gonna talk about um, medical. So heart attacks, seizures, um, hot or cold injuries, alcohol and drug abuse, poisonings, altered mental status, 
behavioral or psychological crisis, emergency childbirth. Those are all the kind of things that we're going to talk about on the medical side. Basic goals of EMR training aim to teach you how to evaluate, stabilize, treat patients using a minimum of specialized equipment. And what it's, we're not saying is we want to give you all these skills um, with a minimum amount of equipment. It's that you're just not going to have these, this a, a lot of equipment. You're going to be doing these hands-on skills, once again, to look to find out if they are sick or not sick. You're going to have to improvise. So I always like to tell people that this job is a lot more about MacGyver. If you don't know who MacGyver is, for some young guys, go look him up on, um, on the YouTube. But MacGyver was a guy that could, you know, make a nuclear bomb with a pack of, of uh, juicy fruit bubble gum and a toothpick and, and something out of the front yard, you know. And so that's what this is about is improvising. Lots and lots of things are going to be done with improvis improvisation. And they help EMTs, AEMTs, and paramedics when they arrive on scene. That's one of the biggest things that a person can do for us is to be able to help us. Whatever that means, it might mean just hold this, or it might mean give us a good patient report, or whatever that means. But to be able to help the next level is going to be a really big deal. So what we're going to want you to do is to know what you should do. It may be better to leave the patient in a position in which he or she is found rather than move the patient without proper equipment or an adequate number of trained personnel. One of the worst things you can do is move someone in an unsafe manner. Two, thing, two people can get hurt, you and that other and, the, and your patient. Now, another thing you see listed, and you see the words in bold, never judge patients based on their cultural background, religion, color, gender, sexual orientation, all that stuff listed. One of the things hard to do is, is to, re, in my opinion, is to remain judgment-free within this job. Now, I don't mean, for me, it's not about all those things on there, but what can be is when you see someone that hurts somebody because of some bad behavior, maybe a, a drunk driver or, or just whatever, and now you've got to take care of them. That can, if you don't separate yourself, that can be really hard to do. It's, it can become easy to be very judgmental. What we have to do is remain professional and remember, you know, that's not what we're there for. We're there just to take care of people, to help people get to the hospital, and that's it. And you see all the other stuff listed too. We should, clearly, we shouldn't be doing that either. So know how to use your uh, EMR life support kit. This course is going to teach you to treat patients using just some limited emergency medical supplies, using those things that you probably carry on your truck or maybe carry, you know, on, whether you're on a fire truck or maybe you're on kind of a first responder kind of thing with your company or whatever you're doing. We're going to teach you how to use those, those uh, emergency medical supplies. So EMR life support kit should be small enough to fit in the trunk of an automobile or on almost any police, fire, or rescue vehicle as well. So although the contents of the kit are limited, such supplies are all you need to provide immediate care for most patients that you're going to encounter. So you see a lot of stuff here, suggested contents of an EMR life support kit. So sometimes you see all these things listed and then sometimes people are carrying commercial tourniquets. Obviously that's gonna be a good thing. That's a life-saving um, device right there. And then nowadays, a lot of people are carrying naloxone or Narcan as well. Um, so that's a, uh, an antagonist to opiates. So if you have somebody that's, you know, overdosed on, it can go from heroin, but also Lortabs and Oxys and all of that stuff. That's something that you can use if you've been trained um, to use it. Know how to improvise. You will often be in situations where little or no emergency equipment is available. So you may have to you may have to do something. You may have to figure out how to make a splint out of, out of a, a box that you have available. Or, you know, you're going to have to be able to improvise. It's important to know how to improvise. So examples of it. Use articles of clothing and handkerchiefs to stop bleeding. You don't necessarily need 4 by 4s Would that would a sterile 4 by 4 be best? Absolutely. May or may not have that, though. So I just mentioned it. You can use some wooden boards or magazines, that kind of stuff, to um, splint an ex extremity. Now, one thing you need to think about is some of these things do require multiple multiple bodies. And if you don't have those, then that can be a real problem. So, you know, make sure you know how to do things and you have the right amount of people doing the, the thing that you need to do. EMRs operate in a variety of settings. So pot problems encountered in urban areas may differ sharply from those found in rural settings. If you haven't been to the city versus the country, 
it's quite a bit of difference. And the way you run calls is quite a bit of difference. Everything from attitudes to um, environment and everything can be significantly different. So regional variations in the climate create conditions that affect the situations you encounter. And then certain skills and equipment in this book are beyond the essential minimum knowledge level required for an EMR course. But these supplemental skills and equipment may be required in your local EMS system. Now let's talk about some roles and responsibilities. <laughs> maintain your body in a healthy physical and mental condition. So maintain equipment in a ready state. Everybody should be good at that already, hopefully. Hopefully you get on shift at, the, at your local fire service and you're checking trucks and you're doing all that stuff. You're not just hanging out in the recliner all day. Uh, hopefully if you're on a, you know, a first response truck at, at your company, same thing. Hopefully you're making sure that you have everything you need, making sure your vehicle is gassed up and all of that. Respond promptly and safely to the scene of an accident or sudden illness. Make sure that scene is safe from hazards. That's going to be important. Protect yourself and then protect everyone else also from any other harm. Getting anybody else that you might need, whether that's EMTs or maybe the fire department or rescue squad. So summon appropriate assistance. Gain access to the patients. You need to be able to, to, be able to get in and to be able to get out safely. Get that patient assessment done. Administer your emergency medical care. Provide assurance to patients and family members and then move patients only when necessary. So one of the hard things that last, that next to last part, that reassurance to patients and family members, don't tell people things that you can't guarantee, things that you can't promise. So don't tell everybody that things are going to be okay and everything, and you know, everything's going to be fine because that mother is going to expect that her baby is going to be fine when you tell her that. In my opinion, one of the better things you can do is say we're doing everything we can. And that just tells people, you're doing everything you can, and that's, that's what we all want to know, is that people are doing the best that they can. Seek and then direct help from bystanders if the event that you need it. Control activities of bystanders. Assist EMTs and paramedics as necessary. It may be that once the um, ambulance gets there, you may need to go into kind of more of a crowd control and to go into um, you know, the scene, a scene control situation. So maintain the continuity of patient care. So going from you taking care of that patient handing it off to the appropriate um, responder, whoever that is, depending upon what's going on. Then documenting your care. Who knows what your uh, system wants you to do. It may be just a little two-sentence write-up or a full patient care report. That's going to be up to your up to your system. And then what's going to be important is that you keep your knowledge and skills up to date. Now, documentation. What you need to remember is documentation is going to be very important. If first off, if you didn't document it, you didn't do it. And if you say, well, no, I did it. I just didn't write it down. No, in court, that means you didn't do it. So documentation should be clear, concise, accurate, and according to accepted policies of your organization. Uh, documentation is important because you're not going to be able to remember the treatment that you give to all of your patients. And I'll tell you, if you get called into court and you didn't do a good job of documentation, Depending upon how many calls you run, you may or may not remember exactly what you did. And next thing you know, you're going to be the one that's on trial because the, what the lawyers do is try to make anybody within the process look bad just trying to get their clients off. So it also serves as a legal record of your treatment and may be required in the event of a lawsuit. And it provides a basis to evaluate quality of care given. So you're also going to have your medical director pull reports and they're going to look through them and make sure that you're doing things right and all of that. So you want to make sure that you're doing a good job on documentation. As you see here, documentation should include condition of the patient when found. So how were they found? Patient's description, initial and later vital signs. Take more than one set of vitals. Get your initial set of vitals and what I recommend is at least one more and at least right before you hand them off, if you have time, right before you hand them off to the um, oncoming crew. Take, go ahead and get another set of vital signs if you're able to. Any treatments that you might have given the patient, agency and personnel who took that over, you probably want to log that down, and then any, any other helpful facts. If you're, if you're writing something that someone told you, then you, it's, it's best to use quotation marks. So because that is a, something that could go into court. So if you just say that they've been drinking alcohol, then and you, now you've got, to, you've got to prove it. How do you know? If they tell you that they had drank six beers, or of course it's two beers, if they told you they had drank two beers before they, they went out on the road, you put that in quotation marks. Patient states that he drank, in quotes, he drank two beers prior to um, getting in his vehicle, or 
or, or however he says it. So, and that's a good idea. To be a good EMR, you need to reflect certain characteristics. So be honest and conduct yourself with integrity. It's going to be a big part of it. You need to be trustworthy. You need to be trustworthy of, of the public's trust, right? So um, it's going to be important that, that you have some integrity about yourself. What this job does is, in my opinion, it magnifies any kind of weakness that you have. You're going to go into places and see things that are sometimes... Um, a little bit suspect to think so it, may, it could be good and bad you may go in somewhere and, and if you have issues with with medication and you're going to go in and take you know grandma's pills and now you've got she's got 50 oxys and you have an issue with that that magnifies your weaknesses it magnifies our broken pieces within us so be aware of that stuff so you need to conduct yourself with integrity uh, professional behavior has a positive impact on your patients. If you don't think so, it does. One of the one of the things is you show up and you're looking like garbage. Your uniform looks like crap and everything else. Nobody's going to trust you. Nobody thinks that you're a, a professional care provider. So make sure that you're squared away. To be a good EMR, you need to reflect certain characteristics. Be honest and conduct yourself with integrity. We just said that. Be aware of patients' feelings. Be motivated to get the job done and understand the limits of your training and skills. Be an advocate for your patients. That's one of the most important things is to be an advocate for your patient. If you don't know what that means, you're on their side. You're wanting to do things, the best thing for them. It's important to be calm and caring. So avoid embarrassing your patients and help protect their privacy. Maybe that means a blanket over them if clothes got ripped or you know whatever. They don't have to say certain things out loud where everybody can hear. Talk with your patients and let them know what you're doing. Let them always introduce yourself. Um, always let them know who you're with and what you're there for. Ask them what's going on today, all of those kinds of things. And remember, this: uh, everything that you find out is going to be confidential. If you go and start talking stuff around town that someone shared with you in confidence, that's, that's really a, a bad characteristic. So appearance should be neat and professional at all times. That is a big thing to us here at Gordon Cooper is that you look professional because there's no reason anyone's going to trust you if you come in looking like a, you know, a doo-doo sandwich. So you want to make sure that you look square, AJ squared away and you're good to go. Physician or medical director is the overall leader of the medical team. We're unable to do our job without our medical director. He signs a little form that says we're allowed to go out into our communities and do what we do. Even here at the school, I have a medical director that signs my form saying that I can teach you guys to go out and do what you do. So we all have medical directors. They all have to put their licenses on the line to get this stuff done. So you see what he does, direct or she. Actually, our I say he, but our medical director here at um, Gordon Cooper is Dr. Brave, and that's Dr. Melissa Brave. So, uh, you know, you have men and women as uh, medical directors. Our medical director, we're lucky enough to have a 20-year paramedic, and then she went into uh, emergency, emergency room medicine and has now been in that for several years. So they direct training courses, help set medical policies and procedures, ensures quality management of the EMS system. So online medical control. Second type of medical control is known as direct or online medical control. Online medical control is provided by a physician who's in contact with the pre-hospital EMS providers, usually paramedics or EMTs, by two-way radio or wireless phones. So in cases where large numbers of people are injured or cases of prolonged entrapment, physicians may respond to the scene to provide on-scene medical control. Yeah, so what we were talking about here, I'm sorry, I didn't read the point, as indirect or offline medical control. So they're the ones that typically most of us deal with, is that type of medical director is one that just kind of sits off to the sidelines, doesn't get all that involved, does what they need to do, but is not actively involved. You have some protocols, you make sure things happen. And then the next one with that we just talked about was the online. That's someone who you can call, you can get advice from, you're going to have um, regular interactions with them. Now, quality improvement. We all need quality improvement. If it's, you know, we don't know there's not a problem if we're, we're not tracking it. So quality improvement is a process used by medical care systems to evaluate the effectiveness and safety of current treatments and procedures. So what it does is one of, it's, it's important, especially when you start talking about new stuff. So when you start talking about new treatments and new 
procedures, it's really important to have quality improvement because you can track that and really find out the effectiveness and safety of this new stuff. So Institute of Medicine has identified six components of the quality improvement process. So safety, actions of EMRs may, must not cause harm to patients, bystanders, or EMS providers. Effectiveness, so EMS care should be based on scientific knowledge and provide the desired benefit to the patient. We're, we've become a, uh, an industry now that's actually based, for the most part, in science. It used to be based upon anecdote. So it used to be, well, I think that that works. It makes sense that that works, and let's try that. Now we have enough people out doing research, and we've been around long enough that you know pol policies and protocols are being pushed by actual science versus opinion, which is obviously very good. Patient-centered, that's another one of our components. So be responsive to the patient's physical needs as well as his or her values, religion, and heritage. You should know in Oklahoma, we run into a lot of people. Um, you can run into any, in someone that's um, a Native American that might have some very specific beliefs to, you know, every, there are just lots and lots of people in Oklahoma that have different needs as well as beliefs. So just be prepared and be respectful. Provide care in a timely manner. So timeliness, that's gonna be one of those components as well. Efficiency, always strive to deliver care without wasting supplies, equipment, or time. So being efficient is gonna be one. Equitable, patient care should not vary between people of different genders, sexual orientations, ethnic backgrounds. Every, what they're saying is we treat everybody right, right? We treat everybody like it's our, our family. We treat, be, by being a patient advocate, which is what we just said a minute ago, we're going to treat everybody appropriately enough said about that so talking about certification certification is a process by which a person or an institution or a program it's evaluated and recognized as meeting certain standards to ensure safe and ethical patient care that's what we're talking about with certification so once certified as an emr you need to follow national and state standards for your level of practice now your employer may set additional requirements for your conduct and practice, that's going to be up to them and, and the, the medical director as to how they set things. But your responsibility to make sure that you keep your certification current by maintaining continuing education requirements and keeping your skills up to date. Now, if you don't do that, you can result in some penalties, which would mean maybe you might end up losing it. So you want to make sure that your skills are up to date. You're doing refreshers and getting your continuing education because you're probably going to put quite a bit of work into this to get this. Um, for, for many of us, this stuff doesn't come very easy because it's all new. Lots of weird words that don't make sense that we've never used and we aren't even sure how to pronounce them. And then just within a few weeks, I need to know what all of that means. Well, that takes a lot of work. So hopefully you won't just, you know, get, gain your certification and then just blow it off and, and not re-up it by, because of your, you know, lack of effort for your continuing education. And everyone's favorite part, summary. So EMR is often the first medically trained person to arrive on scene. We talked about that. They're the ones who are going to be giving that initial care. Now, as I said, it's essential because it's available sooner than more advanced emergency care and could mean the difference between life and death. So it's going to be important that when an EMR gets on scene, they're doing the right thing at the right time until the next level of care gets there. EMRs should understand their roles in the EMS system, which we talked about. We also talked about that typical sequence of events of the EMS system. Remember, reporting, dispatch, medical response, vehicle response, hospital care. Four basic goals are to know what not to do, how to use your EMR life support kit, how to improvise, and how to assist others. As an EMR, your primary goal is to provide immediate care for a sick or injured patient. That's what we're there for. You're there to help. Maybe it's just to help lift someone up with what your service probably calls a lift assist. Literally, you might just be called just to help someone up. Or you can be all the way into some kind of wacky industrial accident out, you know, in, a, in the oil field or all kinds of stuff. So you have from just Mima fell down and went boom all the way to a mass casualty because you're, you're in a place that had a tornado. So you've got all lots and lots of things. So your goal is to be able to provide immediate care for all of these types of people until EMTs or paramedics can get on scene and then assist them in whatever that means, whatever they need.
So once your role in treating the patient is finished, you must record your observations. We're talking about documentation. Make sure you do a good, clear, concise, accurate job of, of uh, documenting all of your information. Medical information about a patient is confidential and should be shared only with other medical personnel who are involved in the care of that particular patient. This is going to be a very um, important topic. And we'll talk about this, but if you've heard the words HIPAA, it's just a whatever acronym or whatever, but uh, this is what we're talking about. So um, this is ending on the, kind of on this point. Do not share people's stuff with anybody else. If they're not involved in the direct patient care, you don't go telling somebody about Sally down on Main Street that she did blah, 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 because you were on the rescue squad and ran out there. Um, that's a HIPAA violation and can end up costing people a lot of money. It can end up costing you your job, your license, potentially money, as well as your, your service. Whether that's an ambulance or a fire service, it can cost everybody some money. So no HIPAA violations. Do not do that. Do not share information with anyone else other than the people involved in the care of the patient. Overall legal medical Overall leader of the medical care team is the physician or medical director. Remember, they're the ones putting their license on the line. And then quality improvement. So we see all those six component areas and um, it's working a quality improvement measures all of those type of things. So that's it. That is 53 minutes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I've got 53 minutes on one screen, 41 on the other. So 41 minutes of EMR. So until next time, have a good one.